So, many thanks to the delegation to Dialogue and Strong School for hosting this event tonight. Um, we have a great panel uh, tonight with leading experts on Iran that are going to share thoughts and insight uh, on this topic that is uh, about Iran. My name is Mila Joka, I am a political analyst uh, specialized in Iran and the Middle East, associate at the Institute for Perspective and Security in Europe. I'm also a contributor to the Huffington Post and I've been working on Iran this last maybe 10 years or so. And here we are now with a nuclear deal that uh, has this capacity to change the dynamics in the region, in the Middle East, uh, because if we remember not long ago, we were talking about military confrontation with Iran, we were talking about tensions and escalations of tensions, and tonight we have uh, the panel who dared to push for diplomacy long before it was fashionable to talk about engaging Iran directly, and now this is something that is very common, and we have so this new dynamic. I'm going to briefly introduce what happened with the nuclear crisis before going more into the economy and the politics in Iran. Because uh, it may surprise a lot of people, but Iran has politics. Um, and it can be very, very dynamic and sometimes violent in the exchanges we can have. But for the nuclear crisis, solving the nuclear crisis has put an end to over a decade of escalation, in which on the one hand, you had more and more sanctions on Iran, and on the other hand, you had more and more capabilities for the Iranian nuclear program. And what's very interesting is that to defend the nuclear program in Washington, Barack Obama and uh, Secretary of State John Kerry finally came very close to the Iranian rhetoric to defend the deal. And Barack Obama and John Kerry were saying that the dynamic that we had, that is to say more sanctions on the one hand, was only bringing more centrifuges in Iran. And they both say that before the sanction, you had um, 300 centrifuges in Iran, and after sanctions, 20,000 centrifuges. Before sanctions, Iran had a few hundred of kilograms of enriched uranium, and after sanctions, more than 10,000 kilograms of uranium. Before sanctions, Iran could enrich at 3.5% its enrichment, and after sanctions, more than 20%. So what has stopped, what has put an end to this crisis is dialogue, uh, understanding, and finally, de-escalation to come to an agreement. So we're going to talk about what's next uh, in Iran. And to talk about this, we have here with us tonight Thierry Coville, who is a research fellow at IRIS, so the French Research Center for International and Strategic Studies. He's a professor of economics in Novasia, a business school belonging to the Paris Chamber of Commerce. He's a research fellow at the French Institute of Research in Iran, or he was in the 1990s. I was. I do work. And he also worked as an associate research fellow uh, of the Iran department at the CNRS, so the National Center for Scientific Research. He worked as an economist in the center of forecasting of the Paris Chamber of Commerce uh, back in 19, from 1996 to 2006, and he was also the editor-in-chief of the magazine of the Paris Chamber of Commerce specialized on international affairs. He is the author of many, many articles you can find easily. Uh, you just need to to go on Google, uh, or you can find his books also on Iranian affairs, including L'économie de l'Iran islamique, Entre Or et Désor, published in 2002. 
uh, and uh, Liran, La Révolution Invisible, published in 2007. And also with us tonight we have uh, Dr. Ardavan Amir Aslani, who is a senior partner in the Paris law firm Cohen and Amir Aslani ASOC, that represents an impressive roster of international clients. He also heads the firm's international law and government relations sections. Dr. Aslani was born in Tehran, educated at the American School of Paris, the law faculty of the Sorbonne, and he holds a doctorate in law. Uh, with a keen interest in international relations and current events, Dr. Aslani, uh, Aslani, Amir Aslani has published several books on Iran, which I recommend uh, to read. Among others, Iran, or Iran, the Return of Persia, Islam in the West, Wars of God, the Geopolitics of Faith, Iran, Etats-Unis, Les Amis de Demain, ou L'Iran après Ahmadinejad, Iran, Israël, Juif et Perse, and this year, L'Age d'Or de la Diplomatie Algérienne, and also, Iran, Le Sens de l'Histoire. And we will have a third guest uh, coming, right, Sébastien Regnaud, oh, okay, who is an economist with a PhD in management and he wrote a, master, uh, a thesis on South Pars, more on the energy sector. He's an associate at the CNR, CNRS, National Center for Scientific Research, and he teaches at the University Paris, uh, Paris Dauphiné. He's also a founding member of the CERF, CERF Iran Economy. And what's very interesting is that he lived in Tehran for the last 10 years. So, we are lucky enough tonight to offer insight on the Iranian society, politics, and economy. So maybe we can start directly with what is interesting for us tonight, that is, uh, on the Iranian economy, and maybe we can, uh, here you can maybe of her a presentation of the structure of the Iranian economy. Can you maybe explain how it is organized and maybe what are the different challenges? I know it's a very easy question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I will do uh, a presentation of the structure of the Iranian economy tonight. <laughs> And maybe I don't have the knowledge, and uh, it's a very complex issue. What maybe we can start is with uh, first just refer to the Iranian to the nuclear deal between Iran and the five plus one, just to give you a sense of the present economic situation in Iran, and uh, maybe uh, some of the challenge because obviously uh, economy. Let's say that. Iranian government has done a big part of its challenge at solving the Iranian nuclear issue through, the, through, the, through diplomacy. That was one of the promises of uh, Hassan Rouhani during the presidential elections. Let's say he has done it. Now there is a new challenge, which is the Iranian economy. It, it's a bit of the paradox today in Iran because, um, let's say, people know I went to Iran twice this year, and I talked to, let's say, as you said, local people. Yeah, not especially high risk. And you have a sense that people are very happy. They don't claim, you know, they, don't, they are not exuberant, but there is a real sense of satisfaction among economic actors in Iran, in the public sector, the private sector. Everyone is happy because the, the nuclear deal is very important. It gives perspective to the people. There is a, the, let's say there is a sense of some optimism in the sense that at least we see an end to the present crisis. Uh, so you can feel this, the, the, let's say the atmosphere is much more positive since, since the agreement, it's clear. Because the, the Iranian economy went through a very severe crisis. For example, there was a recession in 2012, for minus 6.9% according to the Central Bank of Iran. Inflation went to nearly 45% beginning of 2013. 
for some items like food or clothes, uh, inflation was more than 50%. You could say that Iran was on the brinks of hyperinflation. So it has a disastrous, on one of the critics who can put on, on the, this policy of sanctions, that it, you know, it struck the, let's say, I think the, the, the middle class, Iranian middle class, those who could not protect themselves with special support from, you know, banks of the regime. So the, the middle class, and, and it had a huge effect in any country when inflation reached 50%, the, the lower incomes, the middle class are affected. So there is a paradox in Iran today because due to the fall of the oil price in summer 2014, you know, the Iranian economy is still very dependent on oil. Uh, oil represents, uh, in normal days, 80% uh, of the export in Iran and uh, more than 50% of the government revenues. So you can imagine they are the first shock with, uh, due to the sanctions, Iran could, could only export 50% of its oil exports. So it was the first shock. And then they are the second shock with the fall of the oil price, brutal fall of the oil price during the summer 2014. Then the, 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 the impact was today, let's say the growth rate, nobody really knows, it's close to zero to Iran, in Europe. So it's a big issue because uh, in one hand the government says we have won, let's say it has been a win-win situation as they say, so it would, it's good for us, the sanction will be lifted. On the other hand, the economic situation is, let's say, bad. People are complaining because with a, a growth rate close to zero, uh, you know, no, nothing is, is working in Iran today. You know, the, price, the, the, the production is nearly, uh, nearly decreased, so there is a sense that there is a paradox. And uh, maybe I will let, uh, you know, um, economics is difficult enough to study in Iran. It, this argument obviously is used by the political you know, groups in Iran because there will, will be parliamentary elections in, in February 2016. And obviously, the op people who are opposing Rouhani said, you see, you, you told us uh, that, you know, with the nuclear deal, the economic situation would improve. We see nothing. So, and you could say that they are dishonest because, uh, you know, the normal uh, procedure is, would be the International Atomic Agency should, if everything goes fine, everything will go fine, they would, should say at the end of December, Iran has respected its, you know, so they have done what they are, were supposed to do, and sanctions should be lifted in 2016. So the positive impact of the sanctions will be felt in 2016. So we live in a, let's say, intermediary period, which is difficult to manage by the government because they have elections in, in February 2016. So what they are trying to do, and, and they have also a difficult economic situation to manage because uh, one of the success of Rouhani since he was elected, he was able to slow down the, the inflation rate. The inflation rate was 45% 40 as I told you, beginning of 2013. Now, it's, let's say the last data gave us of uh, inflation rate close, 14, close to 14%, which is still high, but the, it's a huge slowdown since 45%. But the government is on, you know, it's a difficult situation, but on one hand, growth rate is close to zero. On the other hand, they know that they have to keep the inflation rate low. So let's say it's a difficult situation to manage for any, for any government in the world because if they stimulate the economy, as they seem to want to, to do, there is a risk that the inflation rate would accelerate. That could be used by, again, opponents to the government. So <coughs> the, the, the government is trying, for example, they have presented a package recently or oh, they, they are trying to, to stimulate the economy. There are other issues that I will talk later, but I don't want to talk too much about economics and you will be bored after a while. So, maybe. so but there are other issues. The, the government wants to stimulate the economy, but the banking system is not in good situation anymore. So what they want to do is to use a central bank to stimulate the economy. But the issue is just to stimulate the economy enough to, I suppose, to, to have some growth before the, the parliamentary election. Why it's difficult to, this, this economic situation is, let's say, it's not a catastrophe, it's not as catastrophic as it was 2012, but 
the, the contrast between your know, optimism due to the nuclear deal and the, the economic situation, which is, let's say, stagnation, can have political consequences. Why? Because the, the big issue is the labor market. Uh, just to give you a, no, the official data say that the unemployment rate in Iran, let's say, would be close to 10-12%. Everyone in Iran knows it. this data do not reflect reality. Just to give you a sense, you, you take, you know, the data are very good in Iran, contrary to what people say, you know, you have a very surprised people. I heard you hear things people say that, you know, Iran is a mysterious country. I mean, just go on the internet and look at the data. Right? You go to Center of Statistical of Iran. So, Center of Statistical of Iran tells you that every year you have, if you take master degree and PhD, you have 600,000 people in Iran. Every year they get a master degree and a PhD. That gives you a sense that these people go, maybe some of the master degree will start a PhD. But you could say that these 600,000 people will, be, will look for a job. How can you provide a job to 600,000 new diplomats, <coughs> you know, from universities, where the growth rate, when the growth rate is zero? No way. So there are a lot of, there are some social, social tensions in Iran that the big issue for the government is how to deal with this situation <coughs> and to get, maybe we we'll talk about that, to, to have some, because the parliament will be very important if Rani wants to implement economic reforms and other reforms. So he need to prepare an economic environment to be victorious in the, the first, in the next parliamentary elections. And also he needs to prepare economic reforms because the, the, if Iran wants to have, you know, let's say, let's say um, a trend of, they can, have a, they can become very an emerging economy, for sure, that would, the potential. But obviously the Iranian government has to implement structural reforms. Just to give, to give you a summary, in, in Iran, the public sector, there is no data, but the public sector controls around 80% of the economy. So the private sector controls only 20%. Everyone knows in Iran that all these jobs I was telling you, only the private sector can create them. Everyone knows in Iran, you know, that if Iran wants to decrease its oil dependency, only the private sector can increase its exports. And uh, uh, decrease the business dependency. So, the privatization is a big issue. But you can understand that to implement the privatization, you need to have the right political environment, you need to have the right social environment, and it's a difficult, you know, in any country, it's a difficult task to do to come from a public sector economy to a private sector economy. It's a very complex. So, that's why, you know, that the, you could say that Rouhani has, let's say, has been between comma victorious in the nuclear issue. Now he has another challenge to overcome, which is the economic issue. We'll see uh, what he will do. There, there are some positive sides. There are also some negative sides. I told you, uh, but it, it will be a, a, a huge challenge for him if he wants to. Uh, you know, he has some political, let's say, some political support now due to the nuclear deal. Obviously, that's for sure. sure. But obviously, he has to show to the Iranian population that he can use this political support uh, to really transform and, and the, 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 big, the most present needs for the Iranian economy to create these jobs for, for the young, uh, young people. I was telling you that in Iran, for example, the president, they would say things like, we live in a country where the first job to you know, people from uh, the university is a taxi driver. So, is it sustainable for any country in the world? No. So, it's, it's really a pressing issue for you. Okay, so. so, we can come back on, on this issue. Yeah, and you mentioned many times the importance of the parliamentary election that will take place in February 2015. Just to go back to 2013, I probably remember the election in, in Iran where Rouhani was elected uh, at the first round with 50, or around 51% of the votes. And the turnout was 73%, and it was a massive victory for Rouhani, who, his, 
a moderate. And it's often a question that comes in France. What is a moderate in Iran? Well, basically, if you look at the political spectrum in Iran, basically you have the reformists and you have the conservatives with Ahmadinejad, who was president from 2005 to 2013. And Hassan Romani can be seen in the middle, in the center. So he, first of all, he had the shoulders to have the political gain of the nuclear crisis, and he got a huge political capital uh, by getting this nuclear agreement. And now I want to know, um, how can we transfer this political capital in the parliament, and what will it bring in terms of change in the society, but also maybe you could explain what are the different political factions in Iran that is political or maybe the military faction and how important this uh, majlis election, parliamentary election in 2016, February, will be. Thank you very much. When the introduction was made by the young gentleman talking about this organization, this delegation for dialogue, Noticed that he was comparing Iran to North Korea and to Turkey. I told myself, I know that Iran does not exactly correspond to our understanding of what democracy is, but for God's sake, it's not North Korea. <laughs> I can assure you it's not North Korea, nor Burma. When people look at Iran, uh, allow me one minute just to be sure, they, they exactly don't know what they're talking about. Last week, Time magazine, which is the best-selling magazine in the United States, had its cover dedicated to Iran, saying how, by 2025, Iran, by changing itself, will change the world. That's the magnitude of Iran's return to the international community. That's what we were talking about. It's not just one country. It's about our future in Paris, in the streets of New York, it's about geopolitics, it's about economy, it's about oil resources. It will have consequences on a number of global issues. When you look at Iran, you're not looking at a country in its current frontiers. You're looking at a country that is a civilization. You know, you have around 15 other countries in, in the vicinity of Iran, those that are Iran's neighbors, that share Iranian civilization. In Kazakhstan, the national hero, Farabi, is an Iranian. In Azerbaijan, the national hero, Ganjavi, is in Iran. They have not written any other language aside from Farsi. The, the New Year of Iran, Nowruz, the first day of spring, is celebrated in 15 countries. The language that the Iranians speak is spoken in, in Tajikistan, it's spoken in Afghanistan and elsewhere. The Shia version of Islam that is practiced in Iran is shared by at least half a dozen other countries. So Iran is not about Iran. It's about a number of issues that have an impact on our daily lives. These upcoming elections that Milad Joka referred to are going to be fundamental. Why? Because Iran, contrary to North Korea, is not a monarchy where you've got the grandpa handing over the power to his son and then to his grandson. It's a country where the structure of power is shared by multiple centers. It is not a situation whereby you've got the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, ruling with an absolute iron fist. No. In front of him, you got a president that is elected through free elections, through elections that have a certain form of freedom and liberty associated there too, because elections in Iran, you know, in advance, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. We have contested elections here. Why don't we have contested elections in Saudi Arabia? There are no elections in Saudi Arabia. So in Iran, there is some form of democracy whereby, in advance, you don't know the results. It's not like in Tunisia during Ben Ali's time, or in Egypt during Mubarak's time, when we, everyone was elected with more than 90% of the votes. Rouhani did a great achievement. He got elected at 50.03% or 67%, less than 51%. This implies that against him, you have half of the population, supposedly, think that everybody voted, that is against Rouhani that does not share Rouhani's views. We saw this other half during the contested elections of Ahmadinejad for a second mandate, where you had 
the young people, the educated people, the middle class, the bazaar, the controlled economy in the streets. And on the opposite side, you had all of those that were hostile to this achievement. The paramilitary organizations, the, the besiege, uh, the, the, the clients of the regime. And let's say it, we also have ultra-traditionalists in Iran that are believers in this version of theocracy that is reigning over Iran. It's a fact. Iran is the only theocracy on the planet, if you exclude Saudi Arabia and Israel. The only theocracy. That being said, once you look at the matter in depth, these elections are coming up. You have people who have profited from these sanctions. The sanctions have annihilated the Iranian economy. The sanctions have destroyed hope in this country. What brought the regime, and Mirad Jurka presented the facts even better, when he was saying that during the sanctions period, Iran was even doing better on the nuclear issue by developing, doubling, tripling its nuclear infrastructure. But the regime feels compelled to change. Why? Not that they have suddenly convinced themselves that they have become paragons of democracy and freedom, that the Western solution is the best one, but because they do not have a choice. Thierry Corbyn mentioned the fact that unemployment in Iran is horrendous. But Iran is different. Iran is like you. It is a country of 83 million people, more than 70% of whom are under the age of 40, people who have only witnessed this theocracy in Iran with us limitations of public liberty, but it's difficult. They are young, but they are also educated, very educated. We saw the numbers that were mentioned, as far as those who are highly qualified in universities, you have more females in graduate schools and in colleges than you do men. The first Fields Prize granted to a woman was granted to an Iranian girl. You have in Iran, a school that can rival MIT as far as its company is concerned. As a matter of fact, in, at Stanford's College of Mechanical Engineering in 2013, out of the 20 PhD students, more than two thirds were coming from Iran, vast majority of them, all of them from one specific college of Chinese University. But all this being said, at the end of the day, there is no future. You have this young population that is connected to the world with the connectivity rate to the internet that is higher than that of Israel. So everybody sees what's going on around the world. Everybody is educated. Everybody is aware. Farsi, as a Chinese and English, is the most spoken language on the internet. And at the same time, what does this government have to offer them, aside from limitations of public freedom and no future as far as the economy is concerned? So the government, in order for it to be able to assure its own survival over time, its own protection over time, had to find a solution whereby something was offered at the end of the day to this youth that represents more than half of the country's population. And that is hope. Hope for the future. Hope that Thierry Coffee witnessed in Iran, in the streets of Iran. Hope that has not yet materialized, but people are hoping that it will come. If it doesn't, the regime is going to take a different path that will have consequences for us to go. Now, these elections are coming up. Those that are hostile to Rouhani don't want him to win. Now he's riding the surf of success because he managed to deliver this nuclear issue. His election was only about the end to the sanctions regime. He promised to the Iranian people that if they voted for him, he's going to put an end to the sanctions. And he delivered on that. But that being said, at the end of the day, where are the results? A couple of weeks ago, before the tragic events that we all witnessed, unfortunately, in Paris, the presidential visit was supposed to occur in Iran, in Paris, where the Iranian president was supposed to drop by. And the, the main criteria that they were trying to identify, the main solutions that they were looking for, was how can, through this visit, they be able to achieve certain announcement effects by telling the public that some high-profile contracts are signed, that the West is coming back, that foreign investment is coming back, and that at the end of the day, there will be an end to this unemployment that is destroying an entire generation, and at the, at the end of the tunnel, the light is available. But you have these people that are waiting on the other side. Those that represent the military industrial mafia complex that controls the Iranian economy. 80%, it was right pointed out, of the Iranian economy is controlled by foundations, charter organizations, paramilitary organizations. This means that in a country of 83 million, only 20% of the economy is in private hands. 
So these people are people who profited from the sanctions, who were involved in contraband of oil. You know, the $150 billion that people refer to when they talk about Iranian assets locked abroad, the government of Iran today only has access to less than 30% of that amount. Less than 30. People estimate that even that goes even lower than 29 billion. So there is no money. However, the country is extremely wealthy. The country is extremely potentially wealthy because of its brains, because of its youth, but also because of its oil and gas. Largest gas reserves in the world. It's the answer to Europe's need for energy, energetic needs. Europe, it can free Europe from its dependency on Russia. It is the answer to the dependency of the world on Saudi and Wahhabi oil. Because Iran and Iraq together have more oil than all of the Sunni countries of the Arabian Peninsula. It is also an answer to what we're witnessing today, that is this conflict of civilization that the Western world is encountering with this version of Islam, of the specific version of Islam, the Wahhabi version. And by Western world, we're not talking about those who are Christian or, or whatever, I'm just talking about those who live and let the other live with its own difference, accepting the other's difference. That's what I call by the best. And today, the answer to that is Islam coming from Iran because of its clergy, because of its hierarchy. Now, these elections are really fundamental because there are people in Iran that are going to try to prevent President Rouhani's group of reformers to be able to push the positions of power. It's going to be too much for them. The presidency, the parliament, the people, it may raise havoc in the centers of power that control Iran, those who are conservative clergy, those who are in those centers of power that control the Iranian economy, in particular, the Revolutionary Guards. So these elections will have an outcome. If Rouhani does not manage at least to convince the Iranian people that there will be change soon, 2016 will be the announce of the end of the sanctions. It will not be the beginning of the results that will happen. It will come by 2017 at the end. So people have to effectuate leap of faith in favor of Rouhani. Otherwise, if Iran does not evolve, I can assure you, we will have difficulties that will be felt not only in Iran, but across the world. Well, thank you for this big picture that it also um, brings the issue of the parliamentary election and all the different um, objectives. Maybe you want to? Yes. I just wanted to um, precise two points uh, that uh, we talk about modernization of, of Iran. You know, I have a journalist, so she told me that the usual cliche on Iran, yes, but this modernization concern only, let's say, the north part of Iran, which is the usual cliche that you hear in some parts. Let's say if you look again at the data, you, you take, well, for, let's say, the most backwards uh, region in Iran, which is Sistan Baluchistan which is also, let's say, more conservative in terms of culture. The number of uh, <coughs> girl students in the university is around 60%, between 15 and 60%. In Sistan and Luchistan, which are, the, let's say, the most backwards region of Europe. The border of Pakistan. border of Pakistan. Uh, some months ago, I went to Khoramsha, which is, again, a more, you know, Arabic part of Iran, where people, let's say, would say, are more conservative in terms of cultural values. You see women everywhere in terms of position. You see uh, couples going out. So even if they are more conservative in some points, this modernization concerns the whole of Iran. You know that's why it is, which is very interesting. In the case of Iran, it's not only you know some parts of society. This, so that's why also it's a complex society because even I would say you can these uh, people who, who are in the military, uh, you know, in foundations, they have children. And let's say their children are as modern, I know, you know, very modern in their thinking. So these people have also to deal with their children, you know, that will need jobs and, and have a better open view of the world. Second point I wanted to talk, I'm, in fact, I'm doing a little research on the private sector of Iran. And it's very interesting to, to see on the ground exactly what was said on the, on the modern, you know, this tolerance view of Iran. I ask questions like, you know, for example, what are the main values of the Iranian private sector? Competency, efficiency. The, the, all the people I met, you know, I met 25 companies, family business. Okay. They all told me, I don't care about main, male, female, even 
some of them told me I prefer to work with females, they are more honest, they are more hard workers. You know. uh, they would tell me, I, I had a question like, imagine that you have a son and a daughter, and your daughter is more compet com you know, uh, efficient, competent than your, your son. Does it, is it a problem for you to, to give your business to your co Only one told me it's an issue because he's afraid that the society will maybe bother his, his daughter. But most of them said, it is, it's not even a question. It's not even a question. On the issue of tolerance, they don't care about, you know, the, the most biggest issue when they hire someone is efficiency. They don't care about religions. They don't care about the age. They don't care about your gender. They want efficient people. These people are just modern, you know? And, and I think we, we, the, the more power, political power and economic power these people will have, the better it will be for Europe and mostly for the region. I don't think there are a lot of places in the Middle East, I'm not expert of other countries, where you have so much tolerance. And it's really a modern view of the world. They don't really, they don't care about religion. I mean, they care for religion in, in, their, in, in, their, in, their, in their own. It's, it's completely a private issue now in Europe, it is, it's, it's middle class. You just don't use, I, I, had, I had one um, one guy from uh, Horamshire, and he told me something interesting. He said, I, I, I was asking some kind of question, like what are the values, you know? And he said, yes, we, we don't want our, to put too much emphasis on religious values. We want people to practice these values in their, in, the way. So the, you know, it was very interesting to say they, they, they don't want to say, let's say, we practice these values because we are Muslim. They wanted to say, that we want to, to practice day to day these values. Okay? So it's a very modern, I'll give you another example. Even in France, that would be, you know, it's not very common to me. I met someone who was heading a family business in agro business, and he told me, I love modern art. In Iran today, I love modern art. So I, I organized a big exposition of modern you know, paintings, and uh, I don't want to, to, to be too much on, so I just put my logo on, you know, on the dam, I was just, to, to, I wanted to be, you know, what you could not sponsor, I had 3,000 paintings, you know, and I organized the exposition, it was just, you know, it was just, it was a, a businessman heading a family business in Iran. You meet this kind of people in Iran. So that's why, you know, this, when, I think it's, you know, we, you can also criticize French diplomacy for not to, be, to stay polite and don't really care about civil societies. But I think that's the most, most important geopolitical issue in Iran. How can you know this civil society, which is so modern, if you could call it maybe Paribas, if you was could be postmodern in a sense. You know, how can they, they they manage more and more the economy? They have the ability to manage the economy. I met three women; they are heading private companies. And one of these women said, give us the companies, we can manage them. One of these women, she was working in the petrochemical sector. Can you imagine? And she, she's recognized as the, one of the best entrepreneurs here. Okay? So these people are ready to, to have an increasing role in the Iranian economy. If they are, if you want, what you could expect as a social dynamic, that if these people can have more power in the economic sector, as it was said, it will have gradually an impact on the political sector. Because like in any country, economic power is closely linked to political power. And that's where there is a fact in Iran. Because the conservatives, they know that. They know that you know, if they lose economic power, they will lose political power. But you were talking about you know, some groups like the Pazdaran. They have some, nobody knows, some part of the economy is in their hands. They know that if there is a real privatization, they will lose some economic power, and for them, economic power is political power. You know, that's where they get the money, that's where you know, they can say we, we, we are important in Iran. So, in a sense, it's, you have a big potential in Iran for to giving you know, more power to this civil society. On the other hand, it, it will be a big fight, because the adversaries of Rouhani, they are determined, determined, and they know exactly what is going on. They know that there, if there is a real privatization in Iran, you know, they will lose all these you know, rent-seeking activities. The Iranian economy will be more open. You will have you know, the, the, the private sector, the real private te sector will take more, more place, and it will have political consequences. That's why this, you know, I, I suppose this 
you know, there is a tendency, we always say when we try to work anymore, that the next elections will be important. Mm -hmm. It's funny to see that for a country which is supposed to be, you know, not a democracy, we, we put so much importance on elections. You know, I've been working on Iran for the last 20 years, and there is always a sense that ah, the next elections are going to. But I think it's, it's a real story. The, the next parliamentary elections, they, they, will, they will be very significant in, in the ability to give the, the political power to Rani and to give him the, the ability to implement this, this economic reform. Well, you talked about the private sector in Iran that is 20%. Uh, and Nobody knows, in fact, but this is well, wrong. Uh, according to all, also many economists, from what I hear and read, uh, but there's also a huge part of the economy that is controlled by the, the Pazaran, as you mentioned. So just to explain, the Pazaran, we talk about the Revolutionary Guards, the IRGC, you've maybe heard of, of them. Uh, the IRGC were created after the revolution, and they, what do they do? They do, like, as they name, its name said, they are the guard, guardians of the Islamic revolution. They were created under Khomeini, because you know when you have a revolution, especially in the Middle East, uh, you need, what, what was needed at that time for the new Islamic Republic was to protect this new state, uh, this new republic, Islamic Republic. And if you take a look at what happened in Egypt, when you had Hosni Mubarak, who was uh, ousted, and then you had elections, and you had the Muslim Brotherhood winning the elections uh, with President Morsi, what happened is that there was a military coup. And in 1979, in order to avoid the military coup in Iran, Khomeini decided to create a paramilitary organization to ensure that the military will not overthrow the new Islamic Republic. And one very important concept in Iran, I believe, is to understand the concept of the economy of resistance. This is uh, an ideology that is very defended, especially by the Revolutionary Guards. And I was talking about the parliamentary elections. Uh, this parliament today in Iran, well, first of all, in Iran, you have 31 provinces. Provinces. The parliament has 290 seats. There's also, there's only one house. There's no Senate in Iran. So one parliament, 290 seats. The vast majority, I would say, three-fourths, 75% of the seats right now are held by people close to the Revolutionary Guards. Meaning that the privatization of the Iranian economic sector, uh, of the Iranian economy, is not necessarily in their interests. So they're, they have been, for some of them, opposing the nuclear deal, knowing that it would open up the Iranian economy. And they represent uh, 100 and around 180 seats, and you have the reformists who represent 75 seats. And also, we need to mention in Iran that you have five seats for different ethnic groups and minorities, even religious minorities, uh, Christians. Uh, there's one seat or so for uh, the Jewish population in Iran, which, by the way, is one of the is, is the largest. Uh, Jewish population in the Middle East, of course, after Israel. And so what's very important is also to understand that these uh, parliament, uh, revolutionary guards also who are very close, uh, who want to maintain this kind of resistance economy, they're going to oppose Rouhani. All right? And this is why this next election is going to be, it's going to be very important to try to balance and shift the Iranian economy toward less control uh, of the state. It was also said that the Iranian people are like you, they're like anybody, of course, <coughs> uh, even though sometimes we tend to associate Iran with very negative images. But the people have high expectations, and Rouhani 
has been the voice for this expectation. We were talking about hope a little bit, like Barack Obama in 2008, that was the slogan. Uh, also, one of his priority was to break the 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 security environment, of course. So he had some speeches who he, in which he criticized this uh, control of the economy by the security apparatus in the country. And this is one of the main objectives. Um, I would like to talk a little bit, uh, maybe, about the, the need for infrastructures corresponding to the need and the expectation of the Iranian people, the different infrastructures uh, in Iran and the role of France uh, with its industries in Iran, knowing that if you go to Iran, 35 to 40 percent of the cars you find in the street are French cars. There are Peugeot, Renault, mostly 206, and they are everywhere. Peugeot has suffered huge losses from sanctions. We also talk about the need for new uh, airplanes. Can you maybe share some insight of the French role in the uh, Iranian economy? It's not insight, it's data. Uh, the, the, the Iranian market was the first market of French company in the Middle East 2005-2006 before the sanctions. So in a way, a bit, I would say stupidly, the French government, I think it's quite a mistake. Uh, we, we applied with uh, such uh, you know, appetites the, the sanctions, which was in fact completely in the US interest. You know, the, uh, so we sacrificed uh, one market we had. We were talking about Peugeot. You know, Peugeot was selling in Iran 450,000 cars every year. Peugeot had the biggest market share in the United market. The United market is one of the car market we're talking about potential, which has a huge potential, even in the world, in terms of the potential. There are 80 million people. They, they need, as if you have been around, you know that a lot of cars need to be, let's say, renewed. Okay? So the, the, the potential is huge. Can you imagine? Peugeot had the, the first market share. And you were saying, due to the sanction, no. You know, as if you know the story, a sanction, a Peugeot was not forced to... to so they, they you know... <laughs> People say, can we trust the Iranians? So that's you, 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 uh, one of the cliches you hear. You, you take the place of the Iranians, we were like Iran Odo, we were working with Peugeot. Suddenly, without respect for any contract they had signed, Peugeot decided to leave the Iranian market for, you know, the sanctions were not constraining Peugeot. And, and they, they, they left the Iranian market, left, leaving their Iranian counterparts uh, just to go on with, you know, production and, and, and the car industry is, is, is I think is in terms of jobs, you know, it's maybe more important, I think that's the biggest sector in Europe in terms, you know, job providing. So you can imagine, you know, the that's why the, it's quite tough now for Peugeot to come back on the Indian market. Renault, I think, did they say uh, you know I'm not I try to be as objective. Renault I think did the right choice. They stayed in Iran and Iran the, the Renault is fabricating the you know the Logan in Iran, and it, it's, it, they are very successful, you know, they, they have invested in Iran, uh, and let's say there is a huge potential in the car sector, you, can, you have to see that, you know, due to the this policy of sanctions that was, you know, supposed to respect human rights on the European side, we, we, we cut 30% of government revenues in Iran, 30% of revenues. So, what the government, Iranian government decided to do is you know, they could not cut on current expenditures to pay the salaries, the wages of the civil servants. So, what they stopped, that was investment in the infrastructure. So, there is huge needs, there are huge needs to, to invest in infrastructure. We're talking about new plates, you know, that's another story, that's another story. They need to buy, you know, new plates because there have been some you know, accidents. They need to invest in, in roads, highways. To build new airports, to build new, to build new ports, to, to renew. With, if you talk about tourism, I think there, there, are, there are huge investments with, which are needed in, in, the, in the hotel resorts in Iran, uh, in the water sector. You know, the water is uh, maybe the most pressing issue now in Iran. The, the, the environmental situation is a catastrophe. Catastrophe. 
So uh, we have huge expertise in, 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 in France in, in the in, you know, water treatment, water distribution. So that's an example. The, I, I was talking to a, um, to a friend in, in Iran and he told me, give me one sector, I will give you, I will tell you there are opportunities for French companies in Iran. So, you know, it, it's difficult to, to, cont to restrict yourself to infrastructure. I think in, in, in ITC, iTech, yeah. Uh, in a lot of sectors, I was talking about tourism, uh, oil and uh, yes. <laughs> gas, you know, oil and gas, so I, I, there are huge opportunities, and I think if the, the, the you know, people were making mistakes saying, you know, for Iranian, Iranian, they will make us pay for extremist position on the nuclear issue. I went in May in Iran, they didn't care. They wanted to work again with French companies. They wanted to have the best price, to have the, you know, the, so, and the French companies have a big, good image in Europe, like Pono, like Total. So they want to, to work again with French companies. Maybe there are some discontent, like on the Peugeot issue. Maybe there are some discontent, they will make us pay for one big contract just to put side. But globally, due, I think, to this modern view, they know that they need the technology, they know that they need the best price, they know they need investment. They, 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 and they just want to work again with French. I think if we do it right, and I, I think we, we are starting, we can really increase our market share in Iran. And, and I, I, I would hope that, you know, we, we can also, uh, that's a big issue, is how can the Iranian government attract French investment? So that's a big issue, okay? Because then, again, we are coming back to the structural reforms that one will have to implement. <coughs> Obviously, it's difficult to attract foreign investment today in Iran with 80% of the economy in the end of the public sector. A lot of corruption, a lot of uh, regulations. So, and the Iranian government knows that if he wants to attract foreign investment, he has really to improve the, the, the foreign, foreign business environment in Iran. But there, if there is, I think there is a huge potential. We can really increase our market share compared to what we have before. Just to confirm, I, I totally concur with what just was mentioned. Uh, in every major mini industrial sector, there is a French answer. Total for the oil and gas, used to develop South Power, the largest gas in the world. In the infrastructure, air, and port infrastructure, that's his involved. On the occasion of us, as uh, Milan is arrival in Paris, we were supposed to announce the signature of ADP recovering uh, the concession rights over the Tehran and Masha Airport, Vinci over Estevan and Masha, and Peugeot, I know this friend, I represent Peugeot. Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, just to clarify, you're, you're so right, but there's one legal issue that you need to understand, and that's the sanctions issue. Is that Peugeot did not decide one day to totally abandon its kind of uh, lead. The reason is the following. At one point in time, despite the fact that Iran represents the second market after France for PESA, huge market, maybe half a million cars, PESA was compelled to leave Iran. Why? Because at a point in time, they needed $3 billion in investments. They opened their capital <coughs> to General Motors, who came in and out for a one year period, and during that period, subjected PESA to the status of US person, which under US laws and regulations, prevented PESA from maintaining an industrial presence in Iran. And PESA, hopefully, is returning in Iran with Iran Port Group, with the 301, 208, 2008 grant, both with Iran Port and Saipa, which historically was launched by, by a French company, because it's called Saipa, Société Amélie Iranienne pour l'automobile. So there is a need for France in Iran. Those are to clarify this. So this is why, yeah, the cases of Renault and Peugeot can be separate. I think that uh, General Motors was bailed out by the U.S. government by 26%, and this is why also the like, the extraterritorial sanctions. This is very important. Uh, applied to a French company because it was 7%. U.S. law says that you are a U.S. person if you have a subsidiary or an affiliate that is listed on a regulated market in the U.S., which is the case with FFG. And this, as a matter of fact, cost hugely for a cost of the market and they're hoping to recover. In the meantime, pursuant to European sanctions, the European Union and Renault reduced its involvement because the banking sector is totally cut off from the world. You should know that in Iran, you're unable to send $100 to 
any person you are, in and out, inbound, outbound. The banking system is cut off from the world market system, and the SWIFT system is not connected to Iran. So there's no way anyone can get officially and legally paid by an Iranian entity. That is the first thing that's going to change should the sanctions be lifted in 2006. Um, before I open up the floor to a, a Q&A, because I'm sure you have a lot of questions to ask, I cannot avoid the, the topic of the role of Iran in the region, especially how it is possible to stop Daesh, or the so-called Islamic State, which I prefer to call Daesh, even if it's the same in Arabic, but at least we don't include the Islamic part in it, and it avoids Arangan. So, and I wrote a, a piece on that, by the way, this morning, that you can find on the Huffington Post, uh, on the different, or the regional mechanism that can be built to stop Daesh, and also the role of Iran, which, by the way, has always been excluded from the talks. And this is why Foreign Minister Jawad Zarif told me in Lausanne that, look, Iran, I, we have always been excluded from the talks. Geneva 1, it's a failure. Geneva 2, it's a failure. Excluding a country is not the right uh, option. And if we want to exclude Saudi Arabia, he said, it will also be a failure. We need to have a new paradigm in which we stop this zero-sum game. This zero-sum game with meaning that if I win, you lose. And if you lose, I win. We need to find, uh, or we need to have a new paradigm that would include all the regional actors. And Iran, as you said in one of the interviews, is the heavyweight of the region. Uh, Iran is the oil resources of uh, Saudi Arabia. Iran is the gas resources of Russia. It is the mineral resources of Australia. It is the economic potential of Turkey. All of this in one country. So it is pretty clear that if you want to exclude set a geopolitical power from the crisis resolution in Syria and Iraq, it's going to be, to be, to be difficult. But for, but for the first time, October 30th, Iran was included in the talks, and for the first time we have a communique, nine points, in which we can maybe hope for the beginning of a political process, because I think that we all agree that ministry strikes without a political process will not end the proxy war, therefore it will still give space for Daesh and its territory. So I would like to have your view on the role of Iran in the region and what could be the changes right now after the nuclear agreement. First of all, I totally agree with uh, your choice of denomination when you talk about Daesh and Islamic State. Because Daesh is this bloodthirsty medieval cult that we all know of. Islamic State, the Saudi Arabia, it's Daesh that has succeeded. <laughs> Just remember it. And I'll tell you why. When you look at the Middle East today, what you're witnessing, and this is the Arab view, is that the entire centers of civilization of the Arab world are controlled by Iranians. They look at Baghdad and they see this predominant Shia country the capital of the Abbasid dynasty, controlled by pro-Iranian proxies. They look at Damascus, the capital of Omaha civilization, and they see it's controlled by Iranian proxies. They look at Lebanon, and they see Hezbollah, where the country has been unable to have a president because of Iranian influence, and they see Iranian influence present. They look to the south, to Sana and Yemen, and they see the Houthis, and they see Iranian presence. They feel surrounded by Iran. But the question is, is there genuinely reason for concern as far as the Saudi version of the future is concerned? Do you think Iran is going to go and invade Saudi Arabia? That's not going to happen. What is shifting today in the Middle East is nothing new. We are just going back to a situation that we witnessed in the 70s and the 60s, 
where Iran acted as the cup of the Persian Gulf, the French expression, the gendarme of the Persian Gulf. That is what's going to happen in the near future. And the world has understood. Once the French decided, and they're in the process of deciding, they're not there yet, of abandoning their vision of the Middle East, which is today primarily based either on concept of selling arms to Saudis and you know, siding with the right-wing part of the Likud in Israel, once they open up their minds, they discover the reality that we are all witnessing today, that had we our eyes open, we would have witnessed the 9-11, that this conflict of civilization is not about us and the Shia version of Islam, it's about us and the Wahhabi version of Islam, persona of the Saudis. 9-11 is about 15 terrorists 13 of whom were Saudis, one UAE citizen, one Qatari, um, crashed on the twins. There were no Iranian Shia or Hezbollah or no one else. This is a fact. And had we our eyes open then, we would have been able to prevent what is happening in our streets today. Now, if we don't stop this Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, we won't be able to stop its propagation across the world. And the only way that we can stop terrorism is going to haunt us for decades is going to be to destroy this force of attraction this government represents for all the disillusioned youngsters of our summer. If you don't destroy that, nothing's going to happen. Then we, then we are confronted with facts. They're saying that 60 countries, including the Americans, the French, the British, the Australians, they're all together trying to bombard this cult for, for a year, and we haven't managed to push them back an inch. How is this possible? I mean, Nazi Germany with 7 million soldiers, with the German mind, the industry, and ideology, we, it was annihilated. And 75,000 Kalashnikov wielding idiots could not be pushed back by 60 different countries. It's a joke. It doesn't work this way. Look at the scenario, and you witness it by yourself. When Tikrit, which is the birthplace of Saddam Hussein, was occupied by the Islamic State, it took 24 hours for Iranian proxies to free the time. 24 hours they came in, they killed the people. They did the same thing in Suleiman Beg and Amir. So when there is a will and there is an intent, it could happen. And the world is witnessing today that there is no way that one can terminate this cancer that the Islamic State represents if it is not without having troops on the ground. And troops on the ground means who? We are not going back from Paris. The Americans are not going back. People have already paid. So the only people who are willing to go back are those who have a vested existential interest in going back. Those who are targeted by the Islamic State, the Iranian Shia and their allies. They are being targeted because of the hate ladder of the Islamic State. The number one enemy is an Iranian Shia. The number one enemy. They hate it more than the Jew, than the Christian, than anything else. It's the Iranian Shia that they have to kill. So the Iranians have a vested interest to go there. And furthermore, in relation to these, I think we're talking about in Iran. Iran is no longer looking in a vacuum. And they feel the pressure of this Islamic fascist movement on its borders to the west of Iraq. The rise of the Taliban and other Daesh movement in Afghanistan, which we're witnessing today. Today, the largest contingent after the Syrians amongst the immigrants coming to Europe are from Afghanistan. Last month, you had more Afghans than Syrians. That tells you how bad that country is doing. Which means that Iran is surrounded by threats. And Iran knows that it has to engage the west to come to the Syrians. Now, that being said, today, what I have a uh, habit of saying that the tragedy of Islam is that Islam has witnessed its renaissance before its Middle Ages. And that's what the Islam is going through today. There needs to be a reform. And this reform can come only from the top, when there's some kind of a hierarchy, when there's some kind of a clergy. The Zaidi movement in Yemen is an example of this. They are, principally speaking, the Shia, one version of the Shia faith and doctrine, but in reality, from a original point of view, they behave and they act exactly just as Sunnis. But what is changing over there is that because of Iranian influence, they were getting closer and closer to the 12 version of Islam that Shia represents in Iran, the Shia version of Iran represents, and further and further away from their Sunni affiliate kind of a version of Islam that was the fiber and non version. And this means that things can change from the top. The Iranian clergy, it has a hierarchy, which means that there is room for controlling extremists 
if the Grand Ayatollah says stop it, people stop it. The revolution, the difficulties, the war against the Americans and Britain in Iraq stopped just because Ayatollah Sistani, who is an Iranian by the way, lives in Najaf, told the people to stop the vendetta against the Americans. One word of Islam. In the Sunni version of Islam, there is no hierarchy. Anyone can kind of call themselves an imam in any basement in the service of Paris and launch a fatwa. In the Shia faith, it's impossible. So we have also this conflict of, of the way we look at theology that may encourage the return of Iran. Because the Iranian version of Islam may be part of the solution towards rectifying the heretic tendencies that Saudi version of Islam is witnessing. And unless we change the system in Saudi Arabia, problems will continue. Because Daesh can kill the people over there. You can kill the, the terrorist cult that they represent. But if you don't destroy the ideology, you won't destroy the concept. In Daesh and Mosul, the books that are being taught in the schools were imported from Saudi Arabia. There is nothing that distinguishes Daesh's philosophy, ideology, from that of Saudi Arabia. Nothing. They cut people's heads off. They crucify decapitated bodies. They cut hands off. They prevent women from driving. It's the same. Now, Iran today has an influence. Its influence only exists in areas where the old Safavid dynasty of Iran existed. That's where the Shia are. You don't have Shia in Indonesia or in Senegal. You have Shia in Iraq, in Bahrain, in Pakistan, immediate countries that surround Iran and personify the Safavid dynasty. But Iran could use these folks, these forces, as leverage against the matters at hand and change them. Because the Arab Spring, when you look at it, was not about the return automatically of religion, and that's what we're observing today. The Arab Spring annihilated only secular regimes, secular republics, Iraq, Syria, Egypt. The petrol monarchies of the Persian Gulf were not hurt. But the problem today is that we need to stop the flow of ideology and funds coming from certain countries in the Arabian Peninsula so as to put an end towards this exasperation. Now what is also changing is that ever since the Americans have understood that they no longer, because of their own energetic independence, they no longer need to depend upon Saudi Arabia. The agreement that they had with the Saudis ever since FDR no longer needed to be implemented because today the Americans can say no to the Saudis, they don't depend upon the Saudis oil anymore. America today produces more oil than the Saudis do. America today is independent in a generic speed. So it can stand up to the Saudis and tell them that they're not in agreement. John Kerry has met the Iranian foreign minister more than any other foreign minister in town. More than the French, more than the British, more than the Russian, more than any other. This implies that the Americans are in the process of effectuating a shift in the political analysis of the region. An understanding that the natural ally of the West in the area, the only stable country, whether you like it or not, the only country which has a notion of a state where there is an organization, is Iran, and that Iran could be an answer to the tumult that is destroying and disparaging whatever values have remained in the area. Iran is not the problem. Iran is going to be the solution. Now, we saw it from a religious point of view, we can see it from a military point of view. Had Iran fallen, for example, uh, in relation to its support for Assad, Assad would no longer be there. The question is not whether Assad is a totalitarian bastard or murderer. We all agree that he's a bastard, a murderer, and a killer of his own people. But when we've said that, what is the other solution? At least under Assad, Christians and Druze and, and Kurds and the Shia are not being chased in the streets and cut into pieces. At least under Assad, women are not being sold on public squares to become sexual slaves. That's what we're confronted with today. And this needs to be stopped. So you're going to witness today a shift as far as energy is concerned. Because the return of Iran on the oil market is going to imply the following. They will put on the market 500,000 barrels of oil. Oil today is around 40 for long-term contracts. This means that Saudis will plunge. They maintain their social stability only by handouts of their local country. And they wield influence abroad by the cash. It's called wallace diplomacy. By the plunge of the price of oil, the Saudis will no longer have the means of pursuing their aggressive foreign policy. The Financial Times this week or last week 
you know, title twice. Saudis are launching an international bond offer so as to borrow money. They've sold out their equity interest to the company and foreign banks, bringing in the cash so as to finance their, their social system, which only survives on handouts. The decrease in the price of oil is going to compel these people to understand that they have to open their economies and they have to open their minds. Iran will help them. And also, Iran is also about Shia empowerment. There is no reason for people in Bahrain, for example, to represent 70% of the population and be dominated by Sunni minority regime pushed into power by the Saudis. Why should that? There should be justice, and Iran will participate. That's why Iran, by changing itself, will change the area in which it lives. And also on the price of oil, I mean, Rouhani, the, the government of Hassan Rouhani has already started to shift the it was dependent on oil, it was to, but, but the, the Iranian revenue were 50% <laughs> and now, two years later, it's 30% and it relies more and more on services because the Iranian economy is an economy of services. And so we, like Iran and Rouhani with his administration has already started to engage this shift. Uh, well, thank you very much and I would like to open the floor for some questions. Yes, uh, so can you please maybe just introduce yourself and ask? Sure, so my name is Tina. I'm a student at the Sun School of International Security. Um, I'm so just <coughs> Iranian. I'm from Mashhad. Um, and my question is, we talked a bit about French role in Iran, but what are, are there any Iranian companies that are right now operating in France or in Europe? And what's the future for Iranian private, um, private uh, businesses in the um, Yes, <coughs> not much, but I, th I think it's a big issue. I mean, the, it's interesting. During the sanctions, we, 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 we saw a huge increase of non oil exports from Europe. So it's very interesting what has happened during the last few Even with the sanctions, but well, uh, Iran started to export more and more manufactured products and agricultural products. It was in the region. For example, the main market of Iranian non oil exports recently now has become Iran. Uh, one year ago, they exported $6 billion of products in Iran. So let's say, I mean, obviously, there is a private sector in Iran. There are real entrepreneurs in Iran. There is an industrial base in Iran which, was, which started during Shah's time. So it's it's not only uh, an economy based on oil. So they have a huge potential on, on oil exports. But I think, you know, in a sense, these sanctions, if you can say, they, they were an opportunity for Iran to, to consider their natural markets, I think, are in the region. There, there was a, a kind of, you know, in Iran, they always think big. So I was, since I've been in Iran, well, yeah, we should export more in the US, in Europe, etc. So be realistic. Your natural markets, where you know the culture, you know the market, are. Iraq, Afghanistan, Central Asia, the, the Gulf countries. By the way, in a while, when the Iranian economy will be more competitive, I told you there are huge <coughs> possibilities of partnership between French and, and, and Iranian companies in the agricultural and business sector, for example, or in other sectors. And then Iran really could be, is, has a very specific location in the region. When, when you are in Iran, you can really export all over the Middle East, you know, in, 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 um, in the Gulf, in Central Asia, uh, even you can think about India, Pakistan, that have huge potential, and also uh, Europe. So really, I think there is a huge potential for Iranian oil and oil exports, and I hope, hopefully, with, with French partnership, and maybe to, to export in Europe. By the way, I think the more non-oil trade can happen in the region, the best it will be also for political stability. You know, I think one of the curse of the region is, you know, to completely be dependent on oil exports. You know, the, the fact that you have so many entrepreneurs, you know, we are talking about more cohesion between countries, they, they, they start to have common economic interests with other questions. They know where better, you know, the, the other countries. I think it would, it would have, you know, uh, also political consequences that would be really appreciable if Iran could export the non oil export. But to answer your question, I think the, the natural markets of Iran are really in the region now. And don't present yourself as Persian. Uh, 
know, Persian is a word that Greens and in California utilize so as to you know, make people think that there is another country called Persia aside from Iran. It's like, you know, you're Greek and I'm from Sparta. <laughs> Persia doesn't mean As a matter of fact, Iran is never called a country Persia. It was always called Iran, which comes from Aryana, which means the light of the area. The word Persian is, is, goes back to 3,000 years ago, and the word utilized by Western Orientalists when they qualified Iran. When so we say Persian, it's my own Persian. And that's what we mean. It's sexy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Question about Islamic banking. I don't know if we have uh, something that just the role of the economy. Sure. You know, Islamic banking, just for all of us to know, at the end of the day, what is it about? It's about a certain number of rules that are in the core of that prohibit and limit business transactions. In particular, the prohibition over interest bearing law. So, what is Islamic bank? I'm going to make it simple. You need $100. I have it. I'm not going to give it to you unless you give me 10% of it. We can't do anything. So what are we going to do? You're going to sell me an object of zero value, such as this one, for $100? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and then turn back to you for $10 payable in a year. The result is you cash in 100 and you're going to give me $110 in a year. So two sales contracts and replace an interest-bearing loan. This is the principle of Islamic finance. Now we're trying to weave around it, calling it ethical, environment friendly, but at the end of the day, it's only about it. For example, if they go out there, you want to borrow 100 million to build a factory, they won't lend it to you with the interest. They will build the factory, buy the equipment, rent it out to you, and that's how the operation works. Now in Iran, it depends upon the school of thought you're referring to. There are five schools of thought in the Islamic faith, Wahhabi, strict prohibition, Hanafi, Iraqi version, open, uh, Maliki, Shafi, and Zaidi, depending upon the school of thought where you are, greater or lesser freedom is granted. In Iran, officially, interest paying loans are prohibited, and it goes through this kind of structure. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a legal subterfuge trying to turn around a, a prohibition that has limited progress. Now, when you look at Islamic finance, the Islamic world today is a billion, four hundred million people. But in reality, you're only talking about countries with money. So it's only the Persian Gulf, Arabs. And that's why when you talk about the Gulf, I get lost. The Gulf of Mexico. The Persian Gulf, that's the name for it. <laughs> so it's only about Persian Gulf, Arab countries, and Malaysia. That's a start point. And it represents approximately 1% of all the investments coming out of these countries. I mean, it's negative. Just, just to... Um, in terms, I agree with what you said, but um, to be honest, to have an honest answer, uh, there is no Islamic bank. It's, 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 a, it's a joke. It's a joke in the sense that, for example, I give you, I give you an example. You know, uh, they, they don't call it interest rate, they call it profit rate. So you put your money uh, in a bank and they tell you, okay, you will get a guaranteed profit rate of 24%. So what is the difference between a guaranteed profit rate of 25% and interest rate? So I, I, I made a little research on, on Islamic banking and talking to Maurice bankers. They told me it's a mess because we try to respect the regulations to do as if, but at the, at the end it's more bureaucracy, more regulations. So we, you know, officially it's an it's a Islamic banking system. And the, what is funny, it's a paradox in Iran that they, they, they have a, Delegations from other countries and they teach them just like that. Where they don't practice it at home. So that's maybe another, another you know, part of I'm going to take a few questions at a time. So I'm going to start with you and maybe you two guys. And we'll have a first round question and then we can maybe continue with you guys. My name is Arash. Um, thank you for all of your insight. I'm just wondering. I mean, I'm obviously happy about the nuclear deal. It's going to open up a lot of investment to Iran, create some job. But still, I can't really come from the idea that we don't have an independent central bank. Privatization is always bought by the you know, revolutionary guard. They have an economic business, like, like next to the military. 
and the Bonyads are owning everything, and they're under the command of the supreme leader. The supreme leader is chosen by people that he basically votes for. So it's like, I, I mean, we have a democratic Majlis. Well, I think that's an important part of it, but I still think that if the economic power is within the religious authority, how are we going to achieve the long-term growth? I can't really imagine that, so I just wanted to know your own insight. Okay, so maybe on the role of the, of the central bank. And we're going to have two other questions, so we can have as many questions as possible. Yes? Yeah, sure. It's actually linked to the previous question. Um, and on the third, two-thirds of the economy is actually controlled by the Revolution Guard, some say 70%. And usually within political transi transition uh, contexts, there is a need to involve the minority who are controlling the economy into the new uh, system. Is there, although it's just the beginning, is there a process of dialogue with uh, the Revolutionary Guards? Is there maybe a group at the moment that actually might be interested in involving the new system before become for military generals to become a businessman, as it was the case in Indonesia or the Sulawesi regime, for example. A lot of businessmen actually were part of the military. So, although it's just the beginning, this may be a light in the sense. Thank you. I don't know if it's related to this question. Maybe we can, if it's not related, maybe we can go after and start with this two more. You can answer some of that issue. Yes, um, on, on the central bank, you know, I don't think it's a big issue. I mean, yes, it would be better to have an independent central bank, but uh, the, the most important question in Iran is our independence. I don't think, you know, because the, the big issue in Iran is that you know, the, the government gets 80% uh, uh, of its foreign exchange from oil, and what they do, they, 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 they transform it, in, that becomes government revenue. So they sell it to the central bank, central bank transforms it in real. Okay? So there is a natural tendency in oil economies for the central bank to, to, create, uh, to create money due to foreign exchange, due to oil revenues. So it would be better to have uh, independence of the Iranian central bank. But I don't think the most important issue in Iran is that well. it's completely politically orientated when they tell you, you know, we know where it comes from. They say, pass down now. You know. I can give you a guess uh, of, you know, the private sector controls 20% of the Iranian economy. Maybe the Pazdaran are everywhere, but maybe they control, let's say, 10% 10, 10 maximum, maybe. They are everywhere. Bonyan maybe control. Nobody knows. The biggest owner of uh, Iranian economy is the pension fund of the social security. And that's, and there have been studies, I can give you the reference, that, you know, there are much, much more important owners than the Pazdaran. So you have not to consider the Pazdaran as a big obstacle to the Iranian economy, to the Iranian privatization. By the way, but in a sense, you know, if you talk with the private sector, you say, okay, we want real privatization. So we are ready to, to, to take a share. But we are fed up with, let's say, um, non-healthy competition from the Pazdaran, from the Bonyan, and from what they call, you know, in Iran, they call them Rosulati. Rosulati means we have too many uh, people, they come from the regime and they create fake private companies and they have rent and so on. So we want real privatization in Europe. That's I think that's where the big battles will come. In. And so for Rouhani to have the political power to impose real privatization. He has, he has started to do it. You know, I think it was very courageous for him to do it because you know he attacked the pass down some you know member because like one year ago he said there are some people in Iran that control the economy, the media, and the political. That everyone knew who he was referring to. Okay? And the past the day the after answer. If you read the Iranian press, you, you have two strategies for for Rani to, to experiment. One, people say it's it's like Iranian culture, you know, maybe you should ask Iranians how they will do it. I think it will be a mix of pressure and negotiation. What I think he has started to do is to tell the Pazdaran, don't go too much in other sectors. Maybe we can negotiate where you could stay active. And you have also rents that, you know, they have, um, a big issue is local contracts with local municipalities. Obviously, the Pazdaran, though they are very active in the construction sector, they were able to get very non-open uh, contract, for example, with uh, Tehran municipality, huge contracts. 
So maybe what is in negotiation, it's a, I think it's a mix of negotiation and political pressure.